Our last speaker in this uh, session is uh, Dr. James McGaugh, uh, who uh, for many of us does not uh, uh, need an introduction. Uh, uh, he's been a world leader in trying to understand uh, the neurobiological systems that regulate the formation of lasting memories and has done uh, seminal work on the role of arousal and other mechanisms, and we'll hear about some of that today. In addition, in the last uh, few years, he's studied uh, a population of uh, individuals who have uh, or demonstrate uh, remarkable uh, memory for autobiographical events, and uh, we'll also hear a bit about that today. Uh, uh, Dr. McGaugh has uh, been the recipient of numerous uh, honors, including some of the highest honors uh, in our field. Uh, he's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's won uh, awards from professional foundations, the William James Fellow uh, Award from the Association for Psychological Science, uh, distinguished uh, contribution, uh, scientific contribution award from the American Psychological uh, Association. Uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, have you here. Here uh, and he, again, he'll be talking about his work on creating lasting memories. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of the organizers for inviting me to an interesting conference where I see some old friends and get some new ideas. Uh, I'm in a, for me, a rather unusual position that uh, many of the ideas that I have in my slides have already been presented. So uh, this will be a review, but it's also a little bit more than a review because I'll give you some additional information that you, you didn't have. Thanks to Kevin for setting the stage, and, and thanks also to the first speaker for talking about consolidation. That'll speed things up, and, and the amygdala. I don't have to introduce that to you, but I will reintroduce it to you as we proceed. Now, let me see. <clears throat> I guess this is it, yeah. Uh, you've already heard about consolidation, which was first uh, studied scientifically, published in 1949 by Carl Duncan at Northwestern University. And he published a figure that looks like this, and I apologize to you people on the left, I can't point on both screens, so I'll just point on one and bear with me. Uh, if, if an animal, this, these are rats, uh, uh, if an animal is trained on a task and given an electroconvulsive shock, Immediately after training, later on the animal will not remember. If that same treatment was given several hours later, the animal did remember. And what D Duncan did was to plot a curve of retrograde amnesia, which fits with the old perseveration consolidation hypothesis, which was talked about in the first presentation, which suggests that memories are stored, the making of lasting memories occurs over a period of time. Memories are stored slowly. Now, in a, in a big series of experiments, <clears throat> uh, my work and the work of many other people has shown that stimulant drugs, including uh, drugs like picrotoxin, bicuculine, deamphetamine, strychnine, and so on, will enhance memory when administered immediately after training, but not at a later time. And these experiments initially were designed in order to determine something about the involvement of neurotransmitter systems in the making of memory. But at some point in time, we stood back and, and asked, I think, a more fundamental question. It's not, will drugs do this, but why will drugs do this? Why are we allowed to do this? Why are we allowed to give a drug to an animal shortly after training and make a stronger memory? Now, if I were designing the brain, I would design a brain, uh, incorrectly, by the way, but I would design a brain in which memories that we have right now would be permanent memories. And they're not like that. You can remember the last word that I used in this sentence now, but you're not going to remember that tomorrow or the next day. There's a difference between recent memory and long-term memory. We ask, why is it then that we have this strange ability to manipulate memory afterwards? And so we came up with an idea. And that is, maybe it is that we have within our bodies substances which will do what these drugs have been doing. And we thought, what are these substances? And we had a lot of bad ideas, because science is mostly bad ideas. And then we had what we think is a pretty good idea. We said, well, what happens is, after an experience, to the extent that that experience is excited, exciting, we release stress hormones. Well, stress hormones could act like the drugs that we had been given. Now, why stress hormones? Well, um, not only are most of our ideas uh, bad, uh, some are good, most of them are bad, but also most of them are not new. And we thought we had this brilliant idea, but this brilliant idea actually occurred to Descartes in 1650, in which he said, the usefulness of all of the passions consisting, that is emotions, 
consist in their strengthening and prolonging in the soul, that is the mind, thoughts which are good for it to conserve. The, the, the function of emotions is to make strong memories, preserve memories. We say, hmm, well, have an experience, you release stress hormone because you're emotionally aroused, and that's gonna make long-term memories. So we said, let's check this out in the laboratory. So we used our then favorite task, which we call inhibitory avoidance. A rat is placed here, it's been waiting two months, its entire life waiting for this experience. <laughs> Put in this alley, walks up into this region and receives a very mild electric shock, and that's the experiment. Then a day later, we put it back in the same box and we ask, how long does the animal wait before it goes back to where it re had received the shock? And in place of going in in 10 seconds as it did the first day, it takes a minute before it goes back in. Then we ask, what if on the first day after it received the shock, we injected a hormone which is normally released by a stronger shock, and we used adrenaline or epinephrine to do that. So the animal received the training trial, immediately after received epinephrine, and then we tested it the next day, the epinephrine goes away. That is, it goes up in the body and it goes down within about three hours. So here's the result. Um, very strongly enhanced memory as a consequence of the epinephrine in the body shortly after learning. If that injection on the previous day was delayed by 10 minutes, less effective, 30 minutes, and in that two hours, it had no effect at all. So this was a defining experiment for us. It said, if we administered to an animal a hormone which it normally would release to itself in a greater amount if the shock had been better, this hormone will strengthen the memory of that experience if that hormone is given shortly after training, but not if it's delayed. So that was the fundamental experiment. Now the rest of this the, uh, the story I have has to do with understanding what goes on in order to provide an account of that. You've seen this before. This is the amygdala right here. We decided to focus on the amygdala because at that time we were doing some electrical stimulation studies and we found that we could enhance memory by electrical stim very light electrical stimulation of the amygdala, and this gave us an idea that we might focus that on that brain region as being a place in the brain which might be activated by the epinephrine. So we infused um, into the uh, uh, amygdala uh, drugs, and I'll show you a series of drugs, but this gives you a cartoon version. Here's a sagittal view of amygdala in a rat, and a cannula going down, and a little drug infusion shortly after training. So in this case, we repeated the experiment. Uh, these are control animals that showed some memory after they were trained, and these are animals that got epinephrine systemically injected. But in these animals, we injected directly into the amygdala the drug propranolol that many of you now know about, which is a beta adrenergic antagonist which prevents the action of epinephrine and norepinephrine, which is what, what is released in the brain. So we injected propranolol into the amygdala, and what we found was that that blocked the enhancing effects of epinephrine. So this was the second bingo. The first bingo was epinephrine did the job, and the second was it acts through influences that involve the amygdala in the animal's uh, brain. Now, a direct implication of that, the propranolol study, is that the actor, the effective ingredient in the brain, is norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is the substance in the brain that acts on these beta adrenergic receptors. So we said, well, what would happen, we forget about propranolol, what would happen if we train an animal and directly infused into the animal brain a little bit of norepinephrine, which is the normal transmitter? And so that's what we did in this experiment. We trained animals, we gave them the shock in the apparatus, and we took several measures. You can just look down here. Here's a dose-dependent enhancement of memory just by infusing a little tiny bit of norepinephrine into the amygdala of the animals immediately after training. And if the animals were not trained, it had no effect at all. So this is a training effect which is amplified by squirting a little tiny bit of norepinephrine into a restricted region of the amygdala, the basolateral region, which we have found is the target area. So we've gone from epinephrine into the amygdala, into the basolateral amygdala, and we found that we can make a stronger memory using Descartes' principle by just 
a little tiny bit of norepinephrine put in there at the right period of time. It has to be put in shortly afterwards. It's put in a later time. It doesn't do the job. Now, one of the uh, possible interpretations of this is that norepinephrine uh, potentiates bad things, or it is a surrogate for bad things. And what I'm going to tell you right now in anticipation is that the amygdala does not care what has been learned. It is completely promiscuous. It doesn't care whether something good, as good has been learned, something as bad has been learned, or something which is unimportant has been learned. And I'll give you examples of that first. This is an experiment in which we first taught the animals that this apparatus is a very bad place, and then we decided to extinguish it. So after it had gotten shock in the apparatus on one day, we put it back in and gave it no shock, and then gave an injection of norepinephrine into the basolateral amygdala. So the animal had an opportunity to learn that this is now a safe place, not a bad place. And here's what happened. Dose-dependent extinction of the memory, which means not that the other uh, memory was forgotten, it just that the animals now remember it is safe. And the norepinephrine, which previously enhanced memory that it's a bad place, now enhanced memory that it is a good place. So the amygdala, when turned on, does not care about what has, been learned on, what has been learned. It simply makes a stronger memory of what it was that was learned. Now, we also tested this in object recognition, which has been mentioned. It's very simple. An animal is shown two objects in a little box. And the next day, it is shown one of the same objects and a different object. And that's all. And the animal pays more attention to the new object. On the first day, there was no significant emotional arousal. Nothing is done to the animal to say, pay attention. It was not shocked. It was not rewarded. It just looked. That's all. And the animal displays the knowledge of that by, by looking here rather than here. So what we did was immediately after the training here, we injected the animals either with norepinephrine or with propranolol after the training. So here is the norepinephrine effect. Here, is, here are the saline controls. Here is the enhancement of memory of having seen objects uh, with norepinephrine infused into the basolateral amygdala. And here is the impairing effect of propranolol put in immediately after exposure to the object on the first day. So we can make the animals have a stronger memory of what it had simply seen, just simply seen, or could make a weaker memory of what the animals had seen simply by manipulating the basolateral amygdala noradrenergically. We did the same thing. I, I, we, did, we have done a lot of experiments on the other major stress hormone, cortisol in humans, which is released from the cortex of the adrenal gland. Um, and I don't have time to show you those experiments except for one. In this case, we, uh, inject, we injected corticosterone, which is like cortisol for the humans, immediately after training in the object recognition. And cortisol, like epinephrine and norepinephrine, produces dose-dependent enhanced memory also. So when you get excited about something, you release both epinephrine and cortisol. Both of these will influence the memory, as seen in the cortisol effect here. Now, in that experiment, we also injected propranolol directly into the basolateral amygdala. And when we did that, that completely blocked the effect of cortisol. So both epinephrine and cortisol, the two major stress hormones, enhance memory independently of the kind of material which is being learned. And both of them act by activating beta noradrenergic receptors within the basolateral amygdala. That is the key thing that has to be activated in order for them to be effective. So first, I showed you that the drugs uh, will do it. Secondly, I showed you that they do it by activating the basolateral amygdala. Now I'm going to, to ask the question, which is more fundamental, does this normally occur? Forget drugs. Forget drugs. Is that what really happens? So to do this, we used high-performance liquid chromatography in which we put down a probe. And this probe then pushes a little solution in, takes a solution out. This solution is analyzed. So we measured norepinephrine, which was being released by the animals online. So the animals are living. They just have the probe in, and we go through the procedure of training the animals and we simply measure 
what's going on in the basal lateral amygdala during this training. And here, here's what goes on. Here's an animal. Shows the, you can see the little hat here and the tubes going up. The animal is being trained. And here are the results. These are individual animals sitting here, and this is a measure of the release of norepinephrine within the amygdala. Just like this, then the animals are trained. And then norepinephrine release is measured for two hours after that, and you can see that it's a mess. And at this point, you see that is so highly variable, how could you draw any conclusions at all? Now, if you look at it for a moment, you can see some conclusions, however. This is an animal that released almost 800% increase in norepinephrine release. That animal never went back into the place where it had been shocked. I call this the postdoc uh, boredom threshold, because nobody wants to watch a rat doing nothing for more than 10 minutes. <laughs> Here is another animal that released uh, over about 550 uh, percent increase in norepinephrine release, that animal never went back in. Here's an animal with a 400 percent increase, that animal never went back in. Here's an animal that went back in 10 seconds, that animal released nor no norepinephrine. What you have here is individual animals who varied in the release of norepinephrine induced by that single foot shock, and that predicted memory tested later. So the best predictor that we have of an animal's retention of this, of this training is how much norepinephrine was released by the amygdala uh, shortly after the training. So we went from epinephrine to norepinephrine in, in, in induced um, uh, effects to measuring the norepinephrine, and they all say the key thing is the norepinephrine in the basal lateral amygdala which regulates the strength of memory. So here's a cartoon which will summarize what I've said so far. We have the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla uh, excreting uh, hormones. The epinephrine, I, did, I did not tell you, but I'll tell you now, acts on peripheral receptors that go up to the vagus nerve where uh, it, it triggers the release of norepinephrine throughout the forebrain, including the amygdala. And that this is influenced by GABA. Uh, we did a lot of experiments uh, on that. It's influenced by opioids, and this is important. Opioids inhibit the release of norepinephrine. Endogenous op opioids prevent the release of norepinephrine, and I'll come back to that later. And then this it, uh, it all influences projections to other brain regions, and it is gated by acetylcholine on the way out. This represents a lot of experiments in which we try to find out the integrating influences of a lot of substance that we had worked on that influence memory. And it turns out that many of the compounds we had worked on previously act by working through the release of norepinephrine and its downstream consequences. Now, um, as uh, Kevin has already uh, told you, the uh, amygdala is richly connected, interconnected with a lot of other brain regions, including the, in particular the hippocampus, but others as well. And in a series of experiments, we have looked at the modulating influence of the basolateral amygdala in influencing memory that is known to involve a participation of different, bra uh, different brain regions, differentially involved different brain regions. And I'll only tell you about uh, work, work with the hippocampus to illustrate the point. In this experiment, we first replicated the work showing that norepinephrine and drugs that activate noradrenergic receptors uh, influence increased memory, and drugs that inactivate the basal lateral amygdala, in this case, the lidocaine, uh, it shuts off the sodium channels, impair memory. So animals are trained, and they get into the basal lateral amygdala, they get a drug that acts on noradrenergic receptor, memory goes up. You shut off the basal lateral amygdala shortly after training, and memory goes down. So we looked to see what was going on in the hippocampus with those conditions. And to do this, we measured an immediate early gene called ARC. And this immediate early gene is known to be involved in regulating neuroplasticity, that is, the connections which are formed uh, between neurons uh, is influenced by this, by this gene, this early immediate gene ARC. So we looked at the expression of ARC protein in the hippocampus induced by conditions which will enhance memory using activation of the amygdala and those that impair, and here's what we got. If we, your controls, 
These are subjects that got a, a drug that uh, activated noradrenergic receptors in the amygdala, and these are ones that got a, a lidocaine, which shut off the basolateral amygdala, and the measurement here is in the hippocampus. So this is direct evidence of amygdala activation or inactivation of hippocampal processing, which, of course, makes it a strong candidate for influencing memory. Now, uh, Kevin Labar also al already told you about experiments in, in humans using brain imaging um, that show that the amygdala is importantly involved in uh, long-term memory in humans. And this is a very early study uh, using the antiquated technique of PET imaging, which is no longer used in such studies because it takes so long to do and it's, it's imprecise. But nonetheless, there's a seminal idea here, and it was an early experiment. Uh, the subjects in this experiment were shown a series of um, emotionally arousing film clips, which in those days were pretty nasty. By the way, parenthetically, they don't work anymore because there's so much horrible stuff on YouTube and, and the rest of it. You've got to show really bad stuff these days to get any effect. But this was bad for the time. And they were injected with radio-labeled glucose, and immediately after it was over, uh, they rated the emotionality of the films, and we also got measures of brain activity uh, using PET imaging. The, ex the subjects thought, yes, all over, okay, five minutes. The subjects thought it was over, and it was not over because several weeks later they got a surprise memory test, and what you see here is a relationship between the bet PET imaging of the amygdala and the subject's memory of the films that they had, had learned three weeks later, and as you can see, there was a very strong relationship. I will skip that. And I will skip this. Um, you remember Descartes, I didn't tell you the whole story. I gave you the first part up here. I didn't tell you, he said that the, um, the usefulness of the passion uh, also consists in the harm they can do in their strengthening and conserving these thoughts more than is necessary. So he not only anticipated the good stuff, but he also anticipated post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, Briefly, there are two studies uh, that uh, have reported that if human subjects are given pro propranolol, the beta adrenergic antagonist, um, uh, if, if they're given to human subjects who have been traumatized within two hours of the trauma, that they will display fewer signs of post-traumatic stress disorder at a uh, later time. And there's one failure to replicate, a study by Stein at San Diego, but he did not administer the propranolol until six hours after training. And as we know, this, these effects are graded. But more importantly, there is a very large study just published last year of um, uh, soldiers who were wounded in the Iraq war, 600 soldiers, and they simply looked to see um, the incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder in relation to the drugs that they were given shortly after their injury. And it turned out that there is one drug that uh, it, it significantly reduces the signs, uh, reduce the signs of post-traumatic stress disorder, and that is morphine. And uh, I was excited about this, and I said, it's too bad they didn't know about our work because morphine reduces the release of norepinephrine. And there are two interpretations. One is the morphine reduces pain. Oh, they got, they got the morphine within one hour, by the way, within one hour after the injury. And uh, I was going to send them an email saying, by the way, you know, we've shown that morphine also reduces pain. Before I did it, I read the paper, and, and lo and behold, they had cited us. And our paper is pretty obscure, by the way, but they found it. And so they offered two interpretations, and they could both be correct. That is, they're not mutually exclusive. But I direct your attention. I think it's a very well done uh, retrospective study. Now, finally, um, what about uh, uh, the subjects who, who don't forget. Uh, some of you know that a number of years ago, I was asked to testify before the then President's uh, Commission on Bioethics. They wanted me to talk about the current status of drug enhancement of memory. And I made the point that I wondered why anybody was interested in drug enhancement of memory anyway, because we can all enhance our memories, first of all, unless we're demented. And secondly, I could think of two consequences in which is probably a bad idea. And one I said was post-traumatic stress disorder. Why would you want to have an enhanced memory of bad memories? And the other is I'd been working with a, a young woman who didn't forget she had a very strong uh, autobiographical memory and she was plagued by her bad memories. 
I mean, it bothered her. It was awful. She, had a, she said she had a split screen uh, of bad memories going on all the time, and she knew she was in the present. So I presented to the, this to the commission, and I think there probably will be some discussion later on of this particular issue. In the meantime, as a consequence of working with this uh, young woman, she got some publicity. Uh, I don't know if some of you may have seen, how many of you, you saw the program in mid-December on, on, on autobiographical memory on, on 60 Minutes? Um, then you saw five of the subjects that we have, who are very interesting people who simply do not forget the events of their lives. This is not what you would call photographic memory. It means that they capture the events that occur on a daily basis and then they remember those for the rest of their, their lives. And this can be public events, that is, this can be CNN, this can be the headlines on the newspapers, but it also can be the things that they, they did. I will just show you one example here from our first subject, but we, have, we are replete with examples from our many other subjects. We ask our first subject to tell us uh, the dates on uh, the days and the dates, uh, I'm sorry, the dates on which Easter occurred on the 23 previous years. And she very quickly wrote down all 23 Easter's. I don't think that anyone here can remember what happened when the last Easter was. I, I doubt that anyone can remember the date of that in the room here. If you have, see me later. Um, <laughs> she got not only all of these right, but she told us, without asking, she told us what she did on each of these days. And if you look carefully, in the 11th grade, the grandparents were visiting for Passover. She's Jewish. And she remembered all of these dates. Our, our other subjects are uh, just like this. Uh, they have these very strong memories. And we are trying to figure out why. And we're trying to figure out if they map on to our findings that we have from the laboratory studies. We have done fMRI. We have done structural MRI. Uh, we are doing genetic analyses. We are doing everything we can except the kitchen sink, and we're thinking of that, to try to figure out what goes on in the brains of these subjects, which enables them to have memories that are different from ours. The final word is back to my idea about why it is that we want to have strong memories anyway. Uh, th th there appears to be no advantage. That is, there is no Albert Einstein in our group. We now have over 10 of these subjects. They just remember their personal experiences, this does not translate in, into a more effective life in any way that we're able to, to see. It's just uh, useful to them because they can uh, reminisce. So for those people who in the drug business who are desperately trying to find drugs that will have big sales uh, so that we can all have better memories, I'm saying save your money. We can do it by ourselves. All we need to do is activate our basolateral amygdala. Thank you very much. <laughs>